Hello and welcome. It's 10am on Friday the 28th of November. You're tuned in to our mid-morning newscast here on Arirang TV. Thanks for joining us on this wet day here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. Oil prices plunge to a four and a half year low after OPEC refuses to cut oil production. No tangible progress was made during a fifth round of Korea-Japan talks over Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. Plus, Nongak, a form of Korean traditional music originally performed by farmers, is added to UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage. And we start with the news that global crude oil prices have plunged to a low not seen since the middle of 2010. This after members of OPEC decided to keep pumping 30 million barrels of oil a day, despite calls from various circles for them to tighten up the taps. Connie Lee starts us off. Oil prices have been on the downward spiral for a while now, but they sunk even further on Thursday after OPEC decided not to cut oil production. Holding a six-hour-long meeting in Vienna, the 12 members of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries decided to maintain their oil output at current levels. In the interest of restoring market equilibrium, the conference decided to maintain the production level of 30 million barrels a day as was agreed in December 2011. After the announcement, Brent crude oil tumbled below 73 U.S. dollars a barrel, a low not seen since May 2010. The decision, led by Saudi Arabia, was reached despite calls from less well-off members who favored a production cut to stem the sliding crude prices. Four uh, years or four years and a half, we have a very uh, decent price, so now price decline. <laughs> That does not mean that we should really, you know, uh, uh, rush and do something. As I said many times to you, that we don't want to panic. The outcome didn't come as a huge surprise, but it will hurt non-OPEC exporters like Russia, which already faces Western sanctions over its role in the Ukraine crisis. Crude prices have been dropping like a stone this year, losing around 30 percent of their value since June. This is due to rising shale oil production in the U.S. and slowing economic growth in Asia and Europe. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Now, inspired by President Park Geun-hye and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's pledge to improve their bilateral ties, this back at the APEC summit earlier this month, senior officials from Korea and Japan met on Thursday for some high-level talks in Seoul. However, progress remains painstakingly slow on the issue of Japan's sexual enslavement of Korean women before and during World War II. Our Hwang sung reports. For the fifth time this year, senior officials from Korea and Japan met to discuss Tokyo's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. What's different about Thursday's meeting is that it came after President Park Geun-hye and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe expressed hopes for tangible progress in the high-level talks when they met on the sidelines of the APEC summit. Around 200,000 women, mostly Korean, were forced to serve the Japanese military during the Second World War, and the issue has long been a thorn in their bilateral ties. Seoul has called on Tokyo to take sincere steps to compensate the aging victims, but Japan insists the matter was legally settled through a bilateral treaty in 1965. An official at Seoul's foreign ministry declined to provide details, but noted that positive progress was made at each round of talks. Despite recent controversy over the comfort women issue, the Japanese official reiterated Tokyo's stance about upholding the so-called Kono Statement. Also discussed was the planned trilateral foreign minister's meeting with China. The official expressed skepticism about the three top diplomats sitting down within the seer, saying it would likely only happen after the December 14th elections in Japan. The two sides will meet again for a sixth meeting in Tokyo next month. Hwang sang Arirang News. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's younger sister has been making more and more appearances with her brother in the country's state media in recent weeks. And to go with her increased public presence, she's been granted an official title. On Thursday, the North Korean Central News Agency referred to Kim Yo-jong as a deputy director of the Workers' Party of Korea, which is a position roughly equal to 
uh, vice minister. The 27-year-old, who can be seen there in the green jacket, was among the officials who accompanied Kim Jong-un when he visited an animation studio in Pyongyang. She is believed to be a staunch supporter of her brother in the absence of their once powerful aunt, Kim Young hee who has been missing from the public eye since the execution of her husband, Jang Sung Taek. Now, a form of traditional Korean farm music and a dance ritual is combined together. It's known as Nongak, and it's been inscribed on UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage. With this inscription, South Korea now has a total of 17 cultural assets on this very prestigious list. Our Kim ji has the details. A rush of adrenaline, and then comes the calmness one feels when encountering Nongak, a traditional Korean music from the early 1900s. Coined as farm music, Nongak was chanted by farmers while working long, back-breaking hours in the field to help them overcome the difficulty of agricultural life. The music is enjoyed today by many Koreans for its upbeat rhythm and performance, and now it's officially recognized by UNESCO as one of the world's intangible cultural heritage. Nongak is Korea's 17th item on the UNESCO list, alongside the country's folk song Arirang and the making and sharing of kimchi known as kimjang. Nongak is a creative art form. The performers and the audience are united as they're invited to join along in the performance's rhythmic changes. The recognition of Nongak as a UNESCO cultural heritage is expected to become a catalyst in the move to preserve the art form, to pass it down to generations. This will be a great motivation to come up with creative and systematic ways to preserve and develop our rich cultural asset. Also added to the UNESCO list this year is North Korea's version of the folk song Arirang, alongside South Korea's version of the song which was added back in 2012. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. The Korean economy is showing signs of improving, but picking up a decent head of steam has thus far at least proved pretty challenging. Some more mixed numbers on this Friday as well. Statistics Korea says the country's output across all industries edged up 0.3% in October from the previous month. Uh, this is good, as it marks a rebound from two straight months of decline in August and September. The agency says the rise was driven by the service sector, which saw output rise 0.8% last month from a month earlier. Production in the mining and manufacturing sector, however, dropped more than 1.5% on month as output in chips and electrical gadgets shrank. And there's been a significant shift in attitude towards marriage. And it's happening right now in Korea. More and more Koreans are saying there's no real need to tie the knot. New data shows more than four out of ten Koreans don't consider marriage something a person has to do. Just six years ago, less than a third of Koreans had that same opinion. The survey conducted by Statistics Korea also found that 47% of Koreans would be willing to live with their boyfriend or girlfriend, something that might have been looked down upon just a few decades ago. Three quarters of respondents also said the process of getting hitched is too stressful, not to mention the financial expense of a nice wedding ceremony. Now, in the global news this Friday morning, here in Seoul, Mexico's president has pledged to overhaul his country's police force that's seen by many as corrupt to the core. Let's get more on this story with Eunice Kim standing by at the news center. Hello, Eunice. Good morning. So the Mexican leader's announcement comes as he tries to quell what seems to be rising anger over there in Mexico over the disappearance of dozens of student teachers. That's right, Mark. And President Enrique Peña Nieto has been under mounting criticism for the lack of action by his government to rein in long uh, term corruption. And he addressed that head on just hours ago, recognizing that the disappearance of the college students back in September was the work of organized crime working in tandem with local authorities. 
Iguala's tragedy, combined with unacceptable conditions of institutional weaknesses that we cannot ignore, a criminal group which controlled the territory of various municipalities. Municipal authorities were part of the various structure of the criminal organization. Municipal police were in reality criminals. And addressing political leaders in Mexico City, President Nieto said he would send an initiative for constitutional reform on Monday to pave the way for Mexico's 1,800 municipal police forces to be taken over by state agencies. He said the overhaul would begin in four of the country's most violent states, including Guerrero. That's where the 43 college students had vanished on September 26th. The government had said that local police handed them to a drug gang, which apparently killed them and burned their bodies. President Nieto also said his proposed measure would remove from power those authorities who are found to be corrupt. Yeah, really gruesome case, isn't it? Uh, but hours before the president's announcement, authorities had discovered uh, 11 bodies partially burnt in southwestern Mexico. And this is significant because it's just an hour's drive from where the uh, students went missing. Do we know whether that's related at all to the students' disappearance? Well, at this point, we don't, Mark. There are reports that there was a message found near the corpses that said they were members of the Ardeo drug gang. So, so far, no indications that those corpses belong to the abducted student teachers. Right, yes. Uh, very violent country, Mexico, and they have a lot of problems to sort out, of course. So, uh, moving just north of the border to Mexico then, and the people in the U.S. are observing Thanksgiving. Uh, on Thursday in the U.S., and this seems to have put at least a, a temporary pause on the unrest and violence surrounding the uh, Michael Brown case. Right. We are seeing relative calm also as that Thanksgiving weekend is forecast to bring very cold weather conditions with it. In Ferguson, police said only two people were arrested Wednesday night in marked contrast to the more than 100 detained in the first two nights of angry protests. Now, residents gathered for turkey giveaways instead and also attended church services where pastors consoled the heartbroken Midwestern community and also prayed for the families of Michael Brown and Officer Darren Wilson. There was also another fatal shooting, a police shooting that came to light. Police in Cleveland released this security video on Thursday showing a 12-year-old boy, his name is Tamir Rice, apparently at a park threatening passersby with a toy pellet gun. A 911 dispatcher, though, uh, apparently forgot to relay that the uh, people reporting this said they didn't believe it was a real gun and that boy was ultimately shot by responding uh, uh, police officers. Police did say that that video was released on the request of the boy's family. It's a very sad case there, Eunice. Thanks for that, and we'll be connecting to you again at noon. See you then. See you. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Today is Black Friday and once exclusively an American holiday shopping tradition where everything from clothes to computer games uh, can be picked up for massive discounts up to 70-80% sometimes. The event has started to take hold in many other countries in, in Europe and including here in Korea and for local retailers it does mean that they're going to have to raise their game and slash their prices to stop local consumers jumping online and uh, snapping up some bargains from overseas. Our Kim Minji reports. Winter seals in Korea are up and running, but they came a couple of days early this year. Why? Because the American Shopping Day, known as Black Friday, which falls on November 28th this year, has also ignited a shopping extravaganza in Korea. 
Afraid of losing out on potential customers during the spree, local retailers are now offering their own Black Friday deals in hopes that customers will shop till they drop. Black Friday now represents a big shopping opportunity not only in the U.S. and Europe, but in Korea as well. We hope our sales promotions in particular will help us tap into the large group of shoppers that prefer to make direct purchases online. This department store has taken it a step further, opening a specialty shop that sells popular overseas brands not usually available in Korea. Products sold here can also be found on overseas online shopping malls. Although the prices run about 30 percent higher, when you consider import duties or delivery charges, the difference basically cancels out. Plus, there's the added benefit of being able to try out products before you buy them. It also offers after-sales services and eliminates the risks of shipments getting lost in the mail. But what spurred the shopping craze in the first place? A surge in Koreans opting to make direct purchases through overseas sites. On Black Friday, the discounts are huge and there are a wide variety of products. I usually make direct purchases about once a week, but this time I'm waiting. Data shows that direct purchases made from Korea last year topped 1 billion U.S. dollars, and the total is expected to nearly double this year. As more people turn to the Internet to buy a wide variety of foreign goods, events like Black Friday are becoming more global. But for retailers, it means more work as they compete to keep customers and gain new ones in an arena that has no borders and continues to expand. Kim min Arirang News. Now, Korea is known for having some of the fastest internet speeds in the entire world, but it could be about to get even faster, perhaps even by 100 times faster, if you can imagine that. Korean researchers have developed a device that they say will do just that and also cut the costs involved in the process. Kim Hyun bin reports. The process of getting internet service at home is more complicated than you might think. At the moment, you try to connect. A signal from the computer terminal box is sent to the internet provider company, which then relays it through two other outside networks. The four-step process is not only complex, it's expensive, since there's a fee for using those other networks, which are foreign-made. But change is coming. Korea's Electronic Telecommunication Research Institute has developed a device that simplifies the process. The optical fiber cable transceiver will cut costs by one-tenth compared to the previous process, and it's made to provide ultra-high speed access. The current system provides the Internet at an average speed of 100 megabytes per second. The new device provides it at 100 times faster, at around 10 gigabytes per second. The new product is still not commercialized, but it's expected to become a hot item once it is, not just because of its speed. Since all networks are integrated, the service price for network and operations could be cut by a third. When the device hits the domestic market, sales will rise at least 50 percent, and it is expected to open up foreign markets in the near future. Experts say the new device is expected to bring in roughly $91 million in sales and will be implemented in the 5G telecommunications and other high-quality multimedia systems. Kim Hyun-bin. Arirang News. Now, in some cultural news, not one but two film festivals have kicked off in Seoul and they will run for the next few days. The Seoul Independent Film Festival has a very long and prestigious history, while the other, the ASEAN Film Festival, makes its highly anticipated debut this year. Our Park Ji Won reports. Ten representative films from ten members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, will be screened for eight days through next Thursday. It's the first film festival in Korea that focuses solely on films from the ten Southeast Asian countries, which include Thailand, Vietnam and Cambodia. Directors and film professionals from the participating countries will visit Korea to hold talks with local audiences after their films are shown. 
The festival was organized by the ASEAN Korea Center in celebration of the two-day Korea ASEAN Summit scheduled for early December in Busan. The culture ministries from each of the 10 ASEAN members have recommended one representative film from their countries. They range from documentaries and dramas to action and romance. The films have a good mix of popular appeal and artistic value. Organizers hope the film festival offers a window for Koreans to see the lives of people living in ASEAN countries. Elsewhere in Seoul, another festival, the nation's largest, dedicated to independent films, gets underway Thursday. The Seoul Independent Film Festival is marking its 40th anniversary this year. Since 1975, the festival has contributed to discovering new talents and creative minds. This year's will screen 125 films, both from inside and outside of Korea, over a nine-day period. 46 of them, 11 full-length films and 35 short films, will be in competition for various awards. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off with the KBO Stove League, where the free agents are looking for the big contracts. And this year, records are being broken, and we're just in the first week of the free agent signing. While SK Wyvern slugger Che Jung broke the KBO record with his four-year 8.6 billion won, or roughly 7.7 .7 million U.S. dollar deal earlier this week, that record is set to be broken soon as Lotte Giants pitcher Chang Won Jun is expected to sign a deal worth 10 billion won, or roughly 9.1 million U.S. dollars. Now this comes after just one year when Kang Min Ho's 7.5 billion won deal, or 6.7 million U.S. dollars, set the KBO signing record. And now moving over to football this time, where Manchester United ambassador and former United midfielder Park Ji Sung is said to be invited to another farewell ceremony, this time with his former Dutch club PSV Eindhoven. With the Dutch club facing off against Fianor this Saturday, PSV will invite Park Ji Sung for a special farewell ceremony, marking his memorable years with the team. Now considered a legend amongst many of the PSV fans, Park Ji Sung scored 15 goals in 87 matches with the team and helped them advance into the Champions League semifinals back in the 2004-2005 season. Now meanwhile, over to swimming and the ongoing controversy over Soon Young's doping scandal. Now with the World Anti-Doping Agency stepping in to investigate the lack of reporting over Soon Young testing positive on a banned substance six months ago, it might even lead to the Olympic swimmer missing the next summer games. Now, according to several Chinese reports, if WADA takes the case to the courts of arbitration for sports, the Olympic gold medalist may face a two-year ban from all international competitions. And if that's the case, the 22-year-old will not be able to participate in the next summer games in Rio and might even lead to him retiring from the sport. And we finish things off on a sad note where cricket fans all over the world received the sad news on Thursday that 25-year-old Australia international Philip Hughes died after sustaining a head injury during a match. Now, despite fans and teammates praying for him to regain consciousness after being medically induced into a coma, the young star never woke up and passed away two days after the accident. Now, doctors say he suffered massive bleeding to his brain in a freak accident where a bouncer somehow missed his helmet and struck him with full force. Now, Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott released a statement calling his death a sad day Player. for cricket. It is prime. Now, our condolences go out to his family, and that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a safe rest of the day, and see you guys again for your sports needs.
Well, it's going to be a rainy Friday today. It started to rain a couple of hours ago here in Seoul, and soon the rain will spread to the whole peninsula. Now, upper regions will receive showers up to 40 millimeters, while the rest will see somewhere between 5 and 20. And this round of rain will pick up each hour before it all completely lets up later in the evening. And unlike mild morning, we had afternoon showers or, or afternoon highs are expected to be a few notches lower than yesterday but still above the averages as daytime high in Seoul and Daegu will rise to 11 while Gwangju and Busan top out at 14 and 17. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island will remain pretty mild getting up to 20 while Daegu and Tukdo see highs of 11 and 12. Now mild temperatures will persist through the weekend but if you plan to be outdoors, Saturday should be a better day because on Sunday we have rain in the forecast then first week of december is forecast to be an icy one with lows plunging to minus four well that's all i have for you at this hour back to you mark in the studio thank you very much Gion, for the weather and that's all we have for now we'll be back at noon korea time until then goodbye